All right. Um, as I mentioned today, we're going to focus on the state of state budgets and the impact of federal aid. My name is Michelle Ekstrom. I am the director of the education program at the National Conference of State Legislatures. And this is one of the twice weekly virtual meetings that we've been holding for you on issues that we know are right front and center. Um, we just had another conversation with some of our education finance fellows who are legislators and legislative staff serving with that uh, with us in that position. And um, one of the comments that was made really resonated with me that it's really hard to talk about finance separately from all of the other challenges that are happening in the states. And so what we've done with this virtual series is try to put together conversations with experts and among yourselves on topics that we know are right in front of you so that every couple of days you have additional information about those issues so that you can make the decisions that you're going to need to make in your state. So I just want to review the protocols for today's virtual meeting. Um, please plan to join us by video rather than phone um, so that you can see the slides that we've prepared for you and so that you have the opportunity for, for full participation. We also would ask that you add your full name in your title by clicking on the three dots up in the upper right hand corner so that we can identify who is on the call. Please mute your audio unless you're speaking. There will be times when we'll ask you to open up your, um, your, your audio so that you can participate more fully. But in the meantime, please be sure to keep it muted so we all can hear well. Um, you also have the opportunity to virtually raise your hand or react. We don't often during these meetings use that fun reaction button at the bottom of your screen. So if you hear something you like, um, feel free to give a round of applause for it. I'm not sure that the news today during this meeting is going to be all that great, um, but if it's useful and if it's helpful information, please um, share that with us. Um, type your questions into the chat box on the right hand side of your screen so that we can be sure to answer those when we're finished with the presentations. We're also going to ask you to type some responses to questions after the presentations, because we want to hear your reaction and your thoughts to things as well and get those recorded in the chat box. Please do not share your screen and under any circumstances, we want to make sure that we stay focused on the content that we're supposed to stay focused on. So don't share your screen. And just a reminder that all of these virtual meetings are being recorded and we post the archive of those um, along with the slides or any other materials on our website and that information is shared for you. So to get us started, as I mentioned, we're going to do um, some chatter or conversation in the chat box today. So what I'd love for you to do is type in the chat box what state you're from and whether you've received your revenue um, or shortfall forecast. And if so, tell us about that forecast. What are you hearing? All right, we're just going to let you continue to do that. So um, today joining us, we have two finance experts. One is Erica McKellar. She will be speaking first. She is our in-house expert at NCSL on state budgets. And they have been gathering a lot of information about how state budgets are trending and what is the revenue forecast. And so Erica is going to share with us today her sense of what she's hearing and um, in our work that we're doing at NCSL to collect that information for you. Our second expert is Mike Griffith from Learning Policy Institute. Mike has been a longtime partner with us in our work on school finance. He's also been doing some analysis and some forecasting based on what he's hearing about state budget projections and what we know about some of the aid that has come down from the, the federal government. I will also add that we have Dan Thatcher, who is our resident um, ed finance expert on the call, as well as Austin Reed, who's our federal affairs counsel in our DC office. They both also can answer questions for us as well today. 
So with that, let's get started with Erica. Erica, take it away. And I'm gonna um, just show for everyone while you're speaking, the resources that we have um, at NCSL. And you'll notice there's that fiscal tile. And if you click on it, there's some resources from Erica's team. Okay. Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, so, you know, uh, we in the Denver office of uh, NCSL are, are really trying to get a handle on what the fiscal conditions of the states are. Um, we're, we're posting information daily on the website that Michelle mentioned, um, but obviously, as, as you all know, there is a lot of uncertainty out there right now around state budgets and state fiscal conditions. Um, some of the most immediate actions we saw states take in response to COVID-19 um, are supplemental appropriation bills. Um, to date, there have been at least 26 enacted, and those have largely gone to um, departments and agencies that have really been on the front line of combating the coronavirus. Uh, we've also seen states start to tap into their rainy day funds. Um, 10 states so far have authorized transfers from their rainy day funds. And some of those have been to um, provide funding for frontline workers, um, but they are also um, in anticipation of some of these staggering um, budget shortfalls that we're hearing about. And um, estimating those shortfalls is, I think, one of the greatest challenges uh, facing states right now. Um, I haven't had a chance to look through that chat box, but I know so many people said they haven't um, officially released any forecasts yet. Um, and I think that's, you know, revenue estimators are, are really waiting to have a better understanding of what the, the full impact of the economic shutdown that we're seeing and the virus uh, will be. Um, we've seen some states uh, start to reopen their economies, but we still don't really know what that will look like um, and what um, that will mean for state revenues. <laughs> um, also complicating revenue estimating right now, um, every state extended their tax filing deadline. Um, for most states, the fiscal year begins on July 1st, and uh, many states have, have extended that deadline past that July 1st date. Um, so that's pushing tax revenue that states had budgeted for in fiscal year 2020 into fiscal year 2021 um, and, and further complicating these revenue estimates for states. We're starting to hear that a lot of official estimates will start coming out in May, um, but a few states have released some preliminary data and we've been talking with fiscal directors around the country. And um, <clears throat> essentially what we've heard from fiscal directors is, you know, states are preparing for a 15 to 20% drop in expected revenues, which is a, is a catastrophic number, I think. Um, just to kind of give a, a few examples from what we're hearing, um, California is preparing for shortfalls on par with the Great Recession, uh, $35 billion short, uh, in the short term and $85 billion in the long term. Uh, Georgia could see a revenue shortfall of 10% of current, what they've currently <clears throat> budgeted for for fiscal year 2021. Uh, Maryland could see a 15% drop in revenues just between April and June. Uh, Pennsylvania is preparing uh, for a $4 billion in lost revenue, and at the same time, they're expecting that um, unemployment claims could cost the state $6 billion by the end of next fiscal year. Um, and South Carolina, revenues could drop 15% for the current fiscal year as well. So obviously, enormous fiscal challenges they're facing states. Um, at the same time, as we saw during the Great Recession, and we typically see during times of economic downturn, um, you know, um, social service programs like Medicaid also become uh, more in demand. Um, we've all seen those skyrocketing numbers of unemployment claims, um, and we don't know when those jobs will come back. So, you know, at the same time that states are losing this revenue, they're also going to face um, increased demands for some of these important programs. So, you know, states will, will get squeezed in both ends, and I think states will be facing some, some difficult choices in the months ahead. Um, obviously, every state will be impacted by the economic shutdown and the, um, the virus that we've seen. Um, but I think a few states that are uh, particularly vulnerable right now, um, oil producing states face some significant challenges with the low demand for oil that we've seen. Um, Alaska in December was projecting oil prices per barrel in their budget at $60. And Louisiana's current budget is based on an oil price of $59 a barrel. Uh, today, the price is around $25, and last week, the price went negative. So <clears throat> we could see some, some prolonged challenges for those oil-producing states if those trends continue. 
Uh, states that rely heavily on tourism are also especially vulnerable. Um, in Hawaii, unemployment is 37% or one in three workers. Um, and in Nevada, they rely heavily on taxes from gambling and the casinos are essentially shut down. So, you know, those, those types of states could see um, some, some really long-term challenges because I think we don't know not only when, when people will really be allowed to travel, but we also don't know how quickly people will when they're allowed to. <laughs> so they could face some, some long-term challenges around that. In addition to um, these fiscal challenges and the uh, revenue shortfalls that we're seeing, um, the, this has also really impacted just the overall budget process. Uh, many states had passed a biennial budget last year um, and several had already passed their fiscal year 2021 budgets before the, um, the virus really hit the United States. Um, and they did so on revenue estimates from, you know, back in December when, when everything was looking pretty rosy for the United States. So um, I think we'll see a lot of special sessions from those states as they come back and try to reconcile their budgets with the, the new reality that we're in. Uh, 20 states are still working on their fiscal year 2021 budgets and obviously they are really trying to get a handle i think on what these new revenue numbers will, will look like um you know passing a budget is never an easy task in any year and clearly the process has really been complicated by um you know states trying to adjourn earlier so that folks can stay safely at home um, sessions being suspended and postponed um, so we've seen states kind of uh, get creative with that process a little bit. We've seen states implement remote voting. Um, we've seen states pass kind of base budgets that they can then come back and work on later. Um, Kentucky typically is a biennial budgeting state, but they've just passed a single year budget, um, knowing that, you know, the, the situation is changing quickly. Um, so we've seen states, you know, get, get a little creative with their budget process this year. But I think, you know, overall, we're going to see a lot of special sessions as states um, get a better handle on the magnitude of the problems they're facing. Um, a little good news is that most states have replenished their rainy day funds since the end of the Great Recession. Um, those balances were very healthy before, before the pandemic hit. Um, so I think those could help soften the blow for states and help them with some cash flow issues. Um, but I don't know that any state really has enough rainy day funds to probably deal with um, the magnitude of the problems that we're going to see. Um, the CARES Act passed by Congress also included $150 billion for state, local, and tribal governments, which is good news. Um, and Treasury released guidelines on that money uh, last week. So states are really trying to get a handle on what allowable expenses will be um, under those guidelines. Um, unfortunately, the guidelines don't include as much flexibility as we would have liked to see. Um, states are not allowed to use it to backfill this revenue shortfall, um, which is problematic because for most states that revenue loss is going to be the greatest cost of, of the situation that we're facing. Um, so those are, are sort of some of the overall trends and things that we're hearing from the states. Um, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions that I can that you might have. So please go ahead and either type your questions into the chat box or just unmute yourself and, and ask Erica any questions that you might have. I think it's, it's always hard to, to ask questions when there's so many unknowns. Everyone's sort of in this late <laughs> Z period, so <laughs> completely understand. But we are updating that website daily, so feel free to, to check back. We're posting, you know, um, revenue estimates that we're seeing. So uh, we expect a lot of activity on that this month. So. That's what I was going to ask you, Erica. I'm getting a lot of questions about that, too, especially from other organizations, um, National Governors Association, um, you know, the the organization of state boards of education or um, the, the secretaries of education who are wondering when we can start to expect those revenue forecasts. Can you, is it for sure probably in May, like mid-May, are we gonna start seeing more activity in this space? It depends on the state. You know, some states that had, had sort of passed base budgets and are waiting to see may not update it as early as some states that are still trying to work on their fiscal year 2021 budgets. but. Um, we've heard from a number of states that they will be releasing some um, estimates in May. Um, we're currently surveying uh, fiscal officers to try to get a handle on some of the preliminary information, um, but I think those official forecasts will come 
in May and, and later into the summer. Do you have one, actually a couple questions that have come in. Um, one is a question about rainy day funds and assets. Um, they comment that it's with the loss of the value of that, those rainy day assets is sort of a double whammy. Um, I guess that brings me to a question also that I've been asked is to what extent do you, are you seeing that states are gonna completely um, deplete those rainy day funds? this year and be in a situation next year where they don't have any and aren't really able to rebuild that? Are you hearing that discussion? Yeah, I think that is a discussion the states are having. Um, you know, it's always a question of how much and when to use those rainy day funds. Um, right now, I think states are using them a lot for cash flow issues. I mentioned those tax filing deadlines have been moved. Um, so states are facing some challenges with that. Um, I think it'll be on a case-by-case -case basis as states um, <clears throat> spend down all of those funds. Um, but I think what states are really waiting for before spending a lot of those funds is what else might come down from the federal government. If the federal government um, allocates more aid for states, then they may not have to rely as heavily on those. So again, one of those kind of waiting to see um, issues. I see we have a couple more questions. Um, Two of them are very related to education budget, so I'm going to wait and ask those of Mike Griffith and our team to see if they have specific information on the education piece. Um, but there is another question. With interest rates so low, are other states talking about borrowing to meet short-term needs? Yeah, so some states are talking about that. Some states don't have the ability to do that. Um, I think I think uh, one thing states are hoping to clarify is whether the coronavirus relief funds included in the CARES Act can be used um, for states to, um, to instead of having to borrow for, for their short-term needs, uh, if they can use them for these kind of cash flow issues, or if that would be considered backfilling revenue loss. So um, waiting for clarification on that, but I think they, most states would prefer to do that rather than borrow. Does that help answer the question? It sure does. Um, as I mentioned, um, I'm going to flash back up on the screen um, the resources that we have on um, all of our, our areas, but in particular, you can click on the fiscal tile on this page on our website, and it will take you to some additional information that they have in the fiscal program and a whole list of where they're tracking which, which um, states are reporting um, information on their revenues. So thank you, Erica. We appreciate your time. Just, really quickly, I'll, I'll address this last question um, on clarification. Um, we've heard from Treasury, they're not gonna revise the guidelines, but they will be updating their frequently asked questions page. Um, and I know we, along with other groups, have been submitting questions to them for clarification. And I've heard that on Monday, they will be updating that frequently asked questions page for the first time. So. Um, take a look at their website for, for that. That's good news. <laughs> we need all the, all the answers, all the we, can answers we can get. <laughs> right. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thanks sure. So we're going to do another um, uh, chatter in the chat box. Um, so if you all could please type into the chat box, um, after hearing the information of Erica, write a word or a phrase that describes your reaction to the news about state budgets. We're just trying to capture um, the general sense of how people are feeling about things right now. All right. Okay, so at this time, we're going to welcome our second speaker, Mike Griffith. He is um, a long time education finance expert that we've worked with. I've worked with him for gosh, 20 years now. And he is a phenomenal partner and assists us in thinking about um, the things that state legislators need to be thinking about and works in tandem with our education finance expert, Dan Thatcher. Um, I have posted here uh, Mike's blogs that he just released over the past couple of days and the information that will be helpful. So Mike, um, please go ahead and join us. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, 
Yeah, so Erica provided us with some bracing news, and, but it was really good and helpful and, and um, helps me kind of get my head around it. I hope it does you too. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on and then what I'm doing at the Learning Policy Institute and what we're trying to do to, to help you all out in states. Um, to start with, I am in my fifth day at the Learning Policy Institute. I started on Monday um, and I have two blogs out already. Uh, we're trying to catch up on this. We're like all of you, we're trying to figure this out. I had a phone call this morning with a reporter and he was um, getting angry at all of my answers being, I don't know. Um, and he said, how can we not know what budget cuts are? And I was saying, no, we're nine weeks into this. Um, it, it really began a little bit for some states at the end of February. And really, it's March and April that have hit it. You know, states just don't have systems that can project that quickly and take these things into account. The numbers just don't come in like that. Um, so I produced a couple of documents. You can see them on the Learning Policy Institute website, or if you want, you can go and see them on the um, Education Week website. Education Week also has them listed. One is to give you an idea, what will you be receiving from the CARES Act. Um, the CARES Act money is about $280 per kid or about 2% of your education funding. So it is helpful. Um, it will help meet some of the additional costs that are going on right now um, and help some districts and states get through maybe in the short term, but um, it is not going to be enough in a lot of states to cover the losses we're looking at. As Erica put it, it's in the 15 to 20% range that we're looking at it in states. Um, I set up these tools so you can look at it however you think it's going to impact your state. We just don't know right now. I've heard numbers as low as 5%. I have seen numbers in some states as high as 30%. And again, what Erica's talking about with some of these states like Alaska, North Dakota, Wyoming, Texas getting double hit with both the recession numbers and the drop in oil prices um, and the increased costs that we're looking at. The next blog I'm working on, and hopefully it will be out next week, looks at what are these costs to states? What are the drops in revenue look like combined with the increased costs we know schools are facing? So there are three big things we're looking at. One of them is increased connectivity cost. The second is increased food service cost, and, and a lot of school districts right now are providing food service to the families in their community that go beyond what they traditionally provide. Um, this has to do both with their students being out of school and still trying to provide food to them, but also that we're seeing massive unemployment in these communities. Um, one of the numbers I looked at, when we're talking 30 million people losing their jobs, that means in the last six weeks, one in five people who had a job six weeks ago now do not have a job. This is combined with the fact that we just have no idea how many people as a percentage or in total have had to take pay cuts. I know of people who are friends of mine who had to take pay cuts to keep their job. There's no way to track that. So there are a lot of people who now just six weeks ago were totally fine, now require some form of food service and schools are providing that. We're trying to figure out what that impact is looking like. The other is what's being referred to now as uh, the COVID-19 loss, which is this idea that students, especially low income students who do not have consistent connection to the internet are falling behind. It's similar to the summer loss. And what can states and districts do to help these kids? And it probably is going to have to be some form of extended learning time. Maybe that's summer school. Um, New York had talked about at one point, I don't know if they're gonna follow through starting the school year in July. I think I just read something that they might not be doing that, but other states have looked at that. Or can you provide these students with something like weekend programs, after school programs to help make up for the loss in the last several months of this school year? Um, so those are the kind of the three costs we're looking at. Uh, I will say, some good news is local property tax revenue will still be there and will be consistent. So those districts that are reliant on local property tax revenue 
will weather the storm a lot better. And the reason for that is uh, property values tend to, uh, it takes a year to three years to get declining property values into the system to reduce your property tax bill. So if your property value starts going down this summer, you don't suddenly get a lower bill, you get it after it was assessed and assessments take one to three years. Um, Dan has produced some incredibly good information about what was it like under the last economic downturn. And I'll touch on it a little bit, but maybe Dan can talk about it a little more in detail. But um, basically, local property tax revenues remained um, intact and rose during the first couple of years of the economic downturn, which goes completely counterintuitive to what we think, right? Because prices collapse then. So local property tax revenue will be there, will help some districts, but it creates another problem. And this other problem is we saw it during the last recession. We also saw it during the downturn of the early 80s and 90s, that there starts to be a separation of have and have nots. Those districts that are more reliant on state revenue lose it and can't make up the difference. Uh, compared to those districts that are more reliant on local property tax revenue, the wealthier places within your states, they've got something to tap. So the wealthy districts tend to be insulated more and the poor districts are not. Um, so, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of run through all of that. I know there are a lot of questions out there. I hope you have them. I also feel if you've got a statement or you think there's something we should know, I'd love to hear it. We're all trying to learn right now. Um, and this is the only way we're going to learn is by hearing from what all you are, you all are doing. Unmute myself. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can be sure to get to all of the questions that have been coming in. So there were a few. Um, that were in the queue before when Erica was speaking that I think would probably be better posed to our education finance experts. The first is how many states rely on gambling revenues for education? With casinos shut down, that is another pressure on budgets to fully fund education in fiscal year 20, let alone fiscal year 21. Mike, can you speak to that or Dan? Um. Is Erica still online? I mean, that's sort of in her realm more, but if not, um, I can take a shot at it. And a lot of states, um, gambling revenue is a small percentage, uh, but in places where it has been earmarked for education, you know, it will definitely take a hit. Uh, again, it's the type of revenue that you can't make up. So if people don't gamble for two months, they won't necessarily double gamble in the months coming up. So revenue there that's lost is lost. The question is how quickly will that come back? And I think that's true with a lot of the things we're looking at, both in retail um, and in uh, food services and any sort of leisure activity or vacation activity, how quickly will those be able to bounce back? And that's a really big question. Um, you know, and when casinos do open up, Will they fully open up or will they be on you know, limited uh, amounts? So yeah, it's, it's gonna be tough, especially in those places uh, where it is earmarked for education. And I, the, the information- Go ahead, Dan. Oh, sorry. Um, this is the inf information from 2007 that I just found quickly in my, my files was that um, of the 38 seven states that I have lotteries or gambling for, um, for state revenue, 16 provide them for K through 12 education. Um, and there, I think there's actually a couple more states that have added, um, added some kind of syntax to that goes now to, toward K through 12. So we could also throw in like can, cannabis in there as well. Yes, that's true. Okay. The next question comes from Asenith Dixon. Are you expecting states or districts to use the majority of funding on cleaning and digital learning as opposed to programming? And I'm assuming perhaps she means federal funds. I'm not 100% sure. I can talk a little bit about the CARES, the CARES federal funding. Um, you could use it for any of those choices. Right now, states are essentially coming up with their plans and 
in districts on how that money is going to be used are this is another one of those things I think we'll only learn what's where the money was spent after it was spent right now we don't know um, where it's going you you have many allowable costs under the CARES Act education funding and it could be used theoretically simply to retain staff and retain your budget but it could be used for things like cleaning technology um, other costs that you face because of this so yeah we're we just don't know and again I, I apologize for saying we don't know um, I'll say too, and, and I think maybe Dan, you can talk even more about this because you were tracking it more than I was. We learned some lessons from the last recession, but we didn't learn as many as we should have. Um, we didn't do a great job of tracking where that money was spent, how it was spent, um, what it went to. Um, there are some general things that we learned, but not nearly as much. And unfortunately now, we don't have as much information to guide us through all this. Um, so I think one of the lessons learned for all of us is let's all try to do a good job of tracking how we do this. And, you know, this is going to happen, not hopefully the virus, but economic downturns happen about once a decade. So the next time this happens, we'll have some information and we can talk about what did we learn. Um, but Dan, do you want to touch a little more on that or? Yeah, sure. And, and this is just from, Mike and I have talked about this. We were, we were around during the Great Recession and, and similar positions and trying to track the amount of federal aid going um, out to states during the Great Recession through, through ERA. And um, governors at that point were, for, for this education stabilization fund that was provided in ERA, were required to submit an uh, application, or I don't know if it was an application or a kind of report to the Department of Education detailing their assurances that they'll maintain a uh, maintenance of effort on certain things and also a, um, a detail on how they were going to divvy up the money between um, K-12 education and our institutes of higher education. But there was not good follow-up on that, that we don't really know what percentage of it went to higher ed versus K-12. Uh, they were also supposed to report on the amount of positions, teaching positions that were going to be saved through this. Uh, that wasn't really followed up well very often. Uh, either. And then um, from just tracking it as a, whether these funds that came through ERA were, um, as they came to the states and then were actually distributed to school districts or institutes of higher education, some states track those as education or as federal uh, funds and federal grants. Others, because they went through the funding formula for the K-12 side at least, considered them state dollars. So our tracking of it of as whether it was federal or state dollars is kind of really murky and we don't have a good idea and it's it was just kind of a, a a balance between getting the money out quickly and and trying to make a good accounting of it and so in that balance we lost a lot of um, kind of good granularity of how it was spent. Austin did you want to add anything about the allowable use of the federal funds? Yeah, I can add a little bit more I'm actually seeing a question uh, about school bus contracts. And I think that gets at uh, sort of the uh, a question we still have about how flexible these funds are. So um, I think what's been covered so far in terms of the federal funds is, is right. They're, they're fairly flexible. Um, we think that they can be used for teacher salaries to a certain extent. There is a clause in the 12 uses that we're still waiting for maybe more clarification on. I put this question to the department uh, in the last couple of days and they said that they were gonna have some additional guidance on how these funds could be used. But there's a clause that says that the funds could be used to maintain, I think it's like the continuity of services and operations. And I've heard that referred to by some analysts as kind of a catch-all clause. And so there, that clause could be the way that these funds could be used for school bus contracts. I'm doubtful of that. And I think we'll have to wait for the department to say uh, yes or no on that one. I imagine that's one that they're, I know that that's been a question that's been brought up for at least the past month. So I imagine that they would have some sort of yes or no on that, but we're not sure. Um, so that's the real question right there is, is that these aren't intended to backfill revenue or to deal with costs that are outside of technology and providing services to students, but there is some speculation about that. So that's the real big outstanding question we have. And the department hasn't, you know, in their initial application package for the K-12 funds, didn't provide any additional guidance outside of saying this is what the law says. And hopefully they're supposed to come out with some in the coming days. So we'll learn a little more, but that's kind of where we're at right now. Still 
more questions than answers. Um, so hopefully they'll provide some clarity on this. Um, we have a question from Representative Dabney from Minnesota. Um, Mike referred to three areas of increased cost, connectivity and food, and I missed the third. What is it? And I've been having questions about this too, just from my neighbors who are saying, how could schools possibly be incurring additional cost right now when they're when schools canceled? So can you enlighten us what the the main um, areas of expenses are right now that have gone up that were unanticipated? And, and again, uh, that third one, just to, I'll answer that and then go back, but the third one was extended learning time to make up for learning loss. And, and again, not for all students, but usually those students who are struggling. Um, yeah, you know, so uh, again, a lot of this we're trying to catch up on the fly. There are definitely costs that are incurred by districts for cleaning, um, for prepping schools. There are costs for online learning and devices for students. Um, and then there are costs for food services. We're also, and, and I just do not know how to model this, but the idea of we might see a blended school year in a lot of places where during part of the school day, students are in person and the other part they're online, or you're, you're facing additional costs. So one of the things I heard someone talk about in a call earlier this week was this idea of what they're doing in Taiwan, which is starting schools, uh, the schools are going on. If more than two students, I believe, or maybe it is two students come down with the virus, that school shuts down. And if more than a certain number of schools within a community shut down, all the community shuts down. Um, so they're kind of going in ways. Once then they, they do the all clear, they're going back to school. So that's sort of the wave idea. You're there in person until you can't be, and then you go back online. Others places have looked at doing half the kids coming in for two days a week, the other half coming in for the other two days, and then all of them are, um, you know, uh, uh, online on the fifth day. Um, so that's one of the other options that places are looking at. All of these come with some cost, maybe not that much for a couple of them, but they're there. The other thing that people talk about, and I just honestly don't think we're gonna be able to put the money aside for it, but we need to, is professional development. How do you teach? This is a very different way to teach, and many teachers weren't prepared for this, quite frankly. And it's going to be even more different if you're doing split time. And I think what a lot of the classes and schools have done is push things off and said, we'll do that next year. So things like lab time, there are ways to do lab time online, but you have to be trained for that, right? Um, all of this are things that will probably be additional cost, but they're very hard to quantify and to, to say what are the, the numbers there. Another thing I heard in Taiwan is don't move the kids around, move the teachers around, so that's less contact. And then don't have them go to a cafeteria. I guess there they put up little blocks around their desk so they eat at their desk, but they have these barriers around them. Um, again, probably not a high cost to do that, but there's a cost involved. Um, I just don't know how you keep, say, fourth graders in a little box while they're trying to eat. Um, that seems very difficult to me. But, you know, so, and again, we're trying to learn all of this stuff, but it mainly comes down to the ones we really know, and we're already seeing the expenses are the food services, the extended time to make up for learning loss, and the connectivity cost. And the connectivity cost is the one that is happening right now. And for some places, they just can't afford it. So I do not know what those students do. And I think they're the ones even more in danger of falling behind if you do not have internet connection at home or you don't have the type of device you really need for this. I, can, I, can I follow up on that just real quickly? And um, I, I know that our, our friends at Edgenomics Lab who track the district budgets pretty closely have mentioned that for those districts that are having some savings at this point in time um, because of the closure, and those may be the districts that were already pretty well um, geared up for digital learning and remote learning, that if they have a balance because of, uh, of the savings, that they, uh, the question is whether they can carry that balance forward over to next year. And different states have different rules about what balances can be carried over from one fiscal year to the next. So it, it might be, um, uh, behoove us to look at it, you know, the rules around that and see if, if you do have districts that do have savings, whether they can carry forward those savings into the next school year. 
Good point, Dan. And, and I think that's that falls into another thing in states and hopefully with the feds. It's this is a time to provide as much flexibility as you can on a lot of these things. So E-rate, for instance, does not allow school districts to provide internet services to their students um, after the school day. That might be something for the next year we ask the feds to give a waiver on or someone asked. Uh, because there are places where they are the provider of the internet, there could be. And I know of school districts, I, I, one I worked specifically with in Texas, that has to turn off their Wi-Fi after five o'clock um, because the school's closed and they cannot provide internet services. There are reasons for that, but this is a time that maybe we, we look at things like that, those, those types of rules being exempted at least for a year. Um, and speaking of Edgenomics Lab, Liz Ross from Edgenomics Lab is posing a question about maintenance of effort, the question that comes up so much. Do you imagine that states will be able to meet this or will they need to ask the secretary to waive it? Austin, I see I mean, you unmuting yourself. <laughs> I was gonna say, usually, Emma usually meets me. In terms of the budget forecast, I think I could use a little help. I mean, I, I think, in our communications with with federal stakeholders, I think it's it's extremely unrealistic to expect that any state will be able to meet the maintenance of effort. Uh, and just to clarify, the maintenance of effort means that, uh, at least for CARES funds, that spending for fiscal year 20 and 21 needs to be as much or greater than the average of the preceding three years. And if states are experiencing any sort of drop in revenue, there's there's almost no way that any state's going to be able to meet that. Uh, we still don't know what the waiver process is like. Uh, we've been asking the department for a month about this and still haven't gotten any clear answers. Uh, um, I was corresponding with them again yesterday about this and, and we, we as an organization are also um, considering some, some larger action. So no, no guidance on this, this waiver process yet, but uh, I think um, everyone is rightly concerned that states are receiving this money through governors and state education agencies and making obligations uh, to the federal government that they'll be able to meet the maintenance of effort, but we have uh, pretty good information to suggest that they will not be able to meet that. Um, Representative Santos posed a question about Secretary P Purdue issuing waivers that affect school-related nutrition and food services. I wanted to point out that Jorge on our staff, um, Jorge responded and um, put a link in there to those waivers so that everyone can see them. Also, we had a response um, and more information about the E-rate piece from Christine Fox. She's actually um, going to be our speaker on Tuesday and she will be speaking about all of these technology and distance learning and um, uh, um, access challenges that we're facing. And so I encourage you to be on a virtual meeting on Tuesday, but she comments that the House bill includes funding the E-rate for home access with special considerations because school is at home now. So she has information and a link that she has posted there for you all as well. Um, let's see here, another question about school food. Okay. I wanted to um, point out, and I may share my screen again here for everybody. I really want to encourage you to check out Mike's blogs. This first blog that he wrote, it's COVID-19 and school funding, what to expect and what you can do. There is a ton of information in this blog. It's very, very deep in information. And there's some analysis too, and I've just taken a quick, screenshot there um, just to demonstrate the kinds of the kind of information that Mike has included in there. And then um, the second blog that I wanted to point you to is his most recent blog on the impact of COVID-19 on the teaching positions. And those of us who work on the issue of educator effectiveness and supporting a highly effective teaching profession, I think are shocked to hear some of these predictions about the impact that this could potentially have on the number of teaching positions that could be lost. Um, Mike has, again, provided analysis where you can look at your state. I've just included a snapshot based on a 15% reduction in state contributions, which 
are the states that will have the highest um, percentage of loss of teaching positions. But there is a ton of information. You can play with the information and um, use a scrolling bar to see like if our state just has a 10% reduction, what kind of impact does that have? So I would highly encourage you to check out these two blogs. They're just um, really, really deep in information. And Dan has put the link to the two blogs in the chat box as well. So are there any additional questions that you all have or do any of you want to share um, the conversations that are going on in your own states? I will say that I was on a conversation this morning with um, CCSSO and NASB, NGA and ECS and we were really um, focusing on how our organizations can be framing the work that lies ahead for all of you and how we could be partnering together to think through, you know, who has expertise in each piece and how can we come together to do that. But our topic of conversation really landed on schools reopening and the fact that um, school districts are pushing very hard for the state to start to come together with a plan. And so just over the past couple of weeks, even within the past week, there are 19 states, NGA is tracking this, that have put together some sort of, of school reopening um, task force or working group. And I would encourage all of you to find out if that's happening in your state. And if so, um, it would be great for you all to be plugged into the conversation as well. We were talking about things like, um, the fact that the school districts, who are the school districts going to be looking to for guidance uh, on if Susie comes to school and she has a temperature, what immediate action does the school need to take? Or if this teacher, because of contact tracing, um, came into contact with uh, somebody who was diagnosed with COVID, what does that mean for that school? And those school districts are looking to the state or to their local health boards or their state health boards for guidance around some of this. They need very, very concrete answers. Like, are they gonna take everyone's temperature when they come in the door? Um, so there's a lot of, of details that need to be discussed and need to be thought through. So I would encourage you to get plugged into those conversations in your state if you aren't already, just to have a sense of what are the decisions that need to be made? And then you as legislators think through, what does that mean for me? How could I, how could the legislature be helpful or what are the kinds of decisions that the legislatures need to be making? I know one um, that also is a big conversation is assessing where students are at as soon as they get back to school. What kinds of assessments are gonna be put in place or what tools are gonna to be used to ensure that we know where kiddos are at when they get back to school in the fall or if the school's open a little bit earlier. How are teachers gonna know what the learning loss was and how to make up that? And so that um, just immediately comes to mind as a decision that I think legislators are, gonna, are going to be thinking through. Um, So we've got a couple of more conversations here. Once the meeting concludes, is the history of the chat available? Yes, the, the chat is archived along with the video on our website. So you'll be able to see all the information that's posted in the chat. Um, and Liz provides information about New Jersey, um, that there's conversation on local districts need to approve budgets and when they will no actual state aid numbers. And I'm sure that, again, is pressure coming up from the school districts um, because they've got to be making decisions about next school year pretty quickly. And so I'm sure there's a lot of pressure on the, the state legislature to figure all this out so they know what their own budgets are. Um, and her question is, are other states seeing this and has there been any discussion about how to make changes to the school budgets? Um, that are due and other changes that may need to be made after the budget is passed if state aid comes in a lot lower and the schools need to cut or increase local taxes. I can, Neighbor, Mike. Um, so New Jersey is a, a little unique as a state. There are five states where you go to the voters with your budget and they need to be approved. 
in most cases, budgets are approved by the, um, by the school board um, or by the community that they're in. So if you're a dependent school district, like New York City School, it's approved by the city itself. So um, there is, has been a push for decades since I've started working to, to somehow require states to report how much is coming from the state to districts. But you know, it gets into one of these classic things. Uh, you can't tie the hands of a future legislature. So you can exempt yourself from that if you're not able to make the deadline. Um, we know it's tight and we know that it's difficult right now for districts to even think about what to do. And the fact that May is the traditional hiring season for new teachers um, adds to the difficulty. So, you know, I know states are, are struggling with this and districts are. I think one of the things you can do from your end in states is start to explain to districts that there are probably cuts coming their way. What I'm hearing from districts is very different than what I'm hearing from state people. Districts don't necessarily think they're gonna face a cut state funding next year. As amazing as that sounds, I, I think it's true. And I think that's one of those, I know you can't tell them a solid number, but I think maybe somehow having a communication with your departments of ed and getting the information out there that they need to start looking at their budgets and thinking about maybe what at least say a 10% cut would look like, and then making a decision to maybe what a 20% cut would look like. But, you know, they need to, they need to know now. Um, once you start the school year, you're already making upfront purchases for the entire year, sometimes in services, sometimes in, in goods. Um, and if they're not going to have the money available for them from the state and they're looking at a cut, they need to know that as soon as possible. Okay, thank you so much. So I am um, going to ask you to use your chat box one last time after hearing the information about the impact on education budgets in the school system. Again, share a word that describes your reaction or your outlook on things. Michelle, why, why folks are doing that, I have a, a question just to pose, a rhetorical question, not to um, necessarily to, for people to answer, but as we looked at the, the budget cuts in the Great Recession to, to education budgets, um, there, were, there was a lot of first winnowing down of um, some of uh, programs that wouldn't be considered part of the core uh, delivery model of education. Uh, then after that, it was cuts to the base aid or the base amount of, um, depending on the state. So say like the, with the foundation formula, states would uh, provide at least $8,000 per pupil to the districts. Um, but then in the next fiscal year to, to make the cuts, they would make, cut that down by $500 or something. But as doing so really created, um, it exacerbated some inequities within the system because some of the districts that couldn't make up for that loss of just the base revenue were really impacted most. So I'm, I'm kind of curious as we're heading into this next um, era of budget cuts, whether districts, or excuse me, states are thinking about, and you as state legislators are thinking about um, how the cuts will be made at this, this time around. Will it be to the base amount? Will, is it the foundation aid that's gonna be cut um, kind of across the board or will the cuts try to be, um, uh, made, made desperately, disparately because owing to the different revenue capacity at the local level or something like that. So again, it's just a rhetorical question and, and uh, based on what we kind of saw from last time around and, and something to, I'm curious to see what's going to happen and hopefully, um, you know, we can provide some help if anyone's looking for on maybe what some options might be. The other thing that I would mention too, um, and I've been thinking a lot about this, but this was just confirmed by an article that was published today in the Colorado Sun where state legislators were interviewed about the types of cuts they thought they would have to make. And I want to make sure that NCSL provides you the information that you need so that when you do have to make cuts, um, if you have the opportunity to um, 
think through what efforts you've been putting in place that may need to be cut or um, be strategic about your cuts. What does the research say about the effectiveness of those efforts that you've put into place? Um, I know, you know, the school finance experts always talk about the fact that so often we make just blunt cuts, but we don't make surgical cuts. And we don't think about the fact that certain things have way more impact on student achievement than others. And I know today when I looked at the list of some of the items that um, the legislators in Colorado said that they may be cutting, it was painful. <laughs> it was cuts to, full, to the full day kindergarten that was just put in place. It was um, cuts to a program that they just put in place to um, try to continue to address our significant um, uh, uh, and persistent dropout rate that we have in Colorado. We've made great progress, but we don't seem to have much, um, we don't seem to have a whole lot of um, progress past that. Um, you know, uh, uh, tuition forgiveness for teachers to try to recruit and retain teachers. So some of those things that they felt like they were making progress on that they feel like they're gonna have to go back and undo. and we want to make sure that you have the information that you need so that if you have to make those painful cuts, you know what will be most impactful um, uh, and what might be something that could go by the wayside, even if it's just temporary. I guess I should also say they're, make, they're planning to make really huge cuts to school counselors, um, which was something they just put a lot of effort into here in Colorado. Um, so on that note, I wanted to mention that we, along with all those resources we want to provide to you, we also are continuing our virtual meeting series and we will continue to do that for as long as it takes for us to keep meeting your needs. As you can see, we have uh, two really great meetings next week. One is on this issue of the technology divide. And then on Friday, we'll be focusing on issues around assessments. Um, how do we measure learning when schools are closed and the assessments have been waived? What is this due to our data system? And what about those college and career ready assessments that are so important to make sure that students are ready um, for college or career? Um, what's happening to those? Are kids still gonna be able to take their AP exams? Those sorts of things. Um, and then we're gonna pivot a little and start focusing on higher ed. Um, higher ed is predicted to be in pretty significant crisis. I know the Wall Street Journal just came out with a pretty dire article yesterday about this. And so we're going to talk for, uh, for that week of May 12th about um, the impact on higher ed. And then we're going to pivot again um, and we'll be focusing on student mental health and also on the learning loss. And what is gonna happen with summer learning? What do we know about what this is gonna look like and what will be the state approaches to summer learning? And then we will be looking at the impact of COVID on the teacher workforce. I'm sure we'll have Mike and the LPI team back for that work. They've been doing great work in that space. Um, we're gonna have a legislative roundup because by then I think a lot of states will be back into session and we'll be, um, um, we'll be acting um, on some of this work that they're gonna have to do. And then we're just gonna keep adding additional meetings and perhaps partnering with CCSSO or NGA or NASB to bring to you um, conversations with other policymakers um, within the states who are grappling with the same thing so that you all can think through how to work with your counterparts in the states. So please plan to join us for those virtual meetings. We will continue to send out updates about those. And thank you for joining us today. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to, happy to assist and um, we'll look forward to seeing you on Tuesday's virtual meeting. Have a great weekend, everyone. Goodbye.